Have you ever found yourself in what you thought might be a no-win situation? You know, a situation in which no matter what option you choose, the outcome just isn't good. That's what we find in one of my mother's favorite movies, The Quiet Man, which I usually watch a couple of times a year, especially around St. Patrick's Day. The movie is about an American, Sean Thornton, played by John Wayne, who moves to his ancestral home in Ireland, where he meets the woman who will become his wife, Mary Kate Danaher, played by Maureen O'Hara. Unfortunately, Sean doesn't get along well with Mary Kate's older brother, Red Will Danaher, so much so that Danaher messes up the wedding plans. Now, when Sean and Mary Kate eventually do get married, Danaher refuses to give Mary Kate her fortune, the, the money and possessions she has earned or inherited throughout her life. Since the fortune it represents her life and her work, without it, Mary Kate doesn't feel complete, and she can't be truly married to her new husband. So she expects Sean to go get it from her brother, even if that means fighting him. However, Sean won't fight. In his past, he was a boxer who killed a man in the ring and vowed he would never fight again. So Sean is faced with a no-win situation. The, the choice between breaking his vow and fighting Danaher or losing his wife. Now, fortunately, Sean chooses to fight for his wife and we get one of the best scenes in the movie. And then Sean and Mary Kate get back together without money coming between them, and they even end up with a better relationship with her brother. Unfortunately, we know real life doesn't always work out with a movie ending. Many people are faced with no-win situations that don't end well. Some people have to choose between working a job they just hate because it pays the bills, but also between uh, that and keeping healthy. Uh, healthy minds, bodies, relationships. Others, while working hard in their career and saving money for their future retirement, suddenly find themselves facing a, a terrible medical condition or having to care for an aging parent or experiencing some other situation that forces them to choose between keeping their retirement funds or giving it up to pay for unexpe these unexpected expenses. Now, regardless of how important either of the options might be, making the choice itself can be traumatic and often with more consequences than we expected. Now, sure, we all have to make decisions like this all throughout our lives, but that doesn't make it any better or easier, does it? So what can we do about these no-win situations? Well, if you're like Captain Kirk from the Star Trek TV and movie series, you cheat. In the 1982 movie, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, we learned that all cadets at Starfleet Academy must face a test called the Kobayashi Maru, in which a ship called the Kobayashi Maru is stranded in enemy territory and it needs help. The cadet who is taking the test must then choose between rescuing the ship, which will prompt a certain devastating attack, and letting the stranded ship just be attacked alone. While the test was designed to test the cadet's character in the reaction to this no-win situation, Kirk rewrote the test so that it could be won. But again, life isn't a movie. We can't just rewrite our circumstances so that they work out for our benefit. The only thing we can do when we're facing certain disappointment or, or certain devastation often is just to accept it or discover another option that we hadn't seen before. Now, even though we might accept the reality of no-win situations, many of us will continue to look for a way out, hoping to discover possibilities that we didn't think of before, right up to the last possible moment before we really have to choose or make a decision. While that doesn't always happen, when we do find a way out, most often it's provided by someone else someone who has a different perspective of the situation, or someone who has the ability to change the situation. That's what we find in John chapter 8, when Jesus was given a test that was designed to be a no-win situation. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, it says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. 
the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now the first thing we need to understand from this passage is that these guys thought they had set the perfect trap for Jesus. There in verse 6 it says that they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. These Jewish religious leaders intended to put Jesus in a no-win situation. On one hand, they had caught a woman in the act of committing adultery, which was punishable by death according to the law of Moses. On the other hand, Roman law prohibited the Jews from putting anyone to death. So if Jesus agreed that the woman must die, well, they could accuse him of breaking Roman law. And if Jesus said the woman could not be put to death because of the Roman law, they could accuse him of breaking the law of Moses, God's law. Either way, they thought they had Jesus where they wanted him, condemned by his own words and actions. As far as they were concerned, there was no way out. Somebody was going to die here. Both Jesus and this woman were as good as dead, except for the fact that Jesus had another option, one that nobody expected. While the religious leaders had set up this test with only two options, both of which led only to death, Jesus came to bring life, which reveals another option. As we've been following John's account of Jesus' life and ministry, we've seen that Jesus came with a purpose, to bring life. It says in John 1 verse 4, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now we've seen over and over again how everything that Jesus said and did throughout the Gospel of John was a sign of his power and authority and purpose to give new life. This was John's purpose for writing down what Jesus said and did in the way that he did. Uh, he tells us in John 20 verse 31 that these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So here, in this moment when death seemed certain, Jesus revealed another sign of the new life he came to bring, God's mercy. While the religious leaders were depending on God's law to confront sin with death, Jesus reveals God's plan to confront sin with uncompromising mercy. The religious leaders thought that because they knew the law, they were in a safe position to contemn both this woman and Jesus. The problem is, the law isn't safe for sinners. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 2 verse 13, It is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And unfortunately, that means that none of us are safe. Paul also writes later in Romans 3 verse 23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So while the religious leaders thought they were using the law to catch Jesus in a no-win situation, Jesus shows compassion, God's mercy, revealing how God provides another option. So as we discover this sign of life from Jesus, we find a way that deals with the death trap of sin without compromise and, and makes us right with God by God's grace. Now first, as, as Jesus confronts sin with uncompromising mercy, he shows us that we need to watch for traps. 
As it says in verse 6, this situation was a test designed to set Jesus up for failure. The Jewish leaders told Jesus in verses 4 and 5, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They thought the trap was in the question of the law, but the real trap was in sin itself. James writes in James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after sin has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. When it comes to sin, there are a lot of traps to watch out for. Clearly, this woman had been trapped in the sin of adultery. There's no denying her guilt. But the religious leaders were also trapped in their own sin of hypocrisy. This is something Jesus called out throughout his ministry, the, the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Like in Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, he told the people, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Throughout the Bible, we also can find things that tempt us in many different areas of our lives that lead us into sins like lies, idolatry, lust, and more. And Jesus warns us to watch out for those traps, like he does in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, telling us to watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We have to watch out because sin is dangerous. Sin is a trap, and it will lead us into judgment, death, and destruction. So we've got to watch out. For the traps of sin. When we discover those traps, or, or actually discover ourselves in those traps, we need to confront the sin without compromise and stand on righteousness. Now pay attention to how Jesus responds to these religious leaders when they try to trap him in verses 6 and 7. It says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, I've heard a lot of speculation about what Jesus was writing there in the dirt. The, the names of the accusers and their sins. The scriptures uh, that were condemning them in their sin. But it's all just speculation. What is important here is the truth that Jesus didn't compromise on righteousness. He stood up and redirected their attention from the woman's sin to their own sin. Jesus taught the people that when it comes to confronting sin, the place to start is with ourselves, not someone else. Jesus said in Luke chapter two or six, verses 41 and 42, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, church, this is a dangerous part of the trap of sin, thinking that we have no sin, but finding it in others. We who have received new life from Jesus by God's mercy need to be careful that when we stand on righteousness, that we don't simply call attention to the sins of the world around us to make ourselves seem better. That's part of the hypocrisy that trapped these religious leaders. While they were quick to grab this woman and, and use her sin to trap Jesus, they were ignoring their own sinfulness until Jesus called attention to it. In verses 8 and 9, it says, Again, he stooped down and rode on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, confronted with the truth of their own sinfulness, these accusers found they had nothing to stand on. 
And they left the woman with Jesus, who alone stood on righteousness for her defense. Now John explains this later on in a letter to the early church in 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. He writes, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is how God showed his mercy to us through Jesus, who gave us new life through his own sacrifice, standing on his own righteousness before God in our defense. If we want to receive that new life then, we need to trust Jesus to take care of our sin by God's mercy. And then when we receive that new life, we need to show the signs that we have received it by showing mercy to other people as Jesus did. In other words, we also need to stand on grace. Now when I say grace, I'm talking about God's gift of mercy, his forgiveness of sins through Jesus. Jesus stood on God's grace when he forgave the woman who was caught in adultery. It says in verses 10 and 11 that Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus didn't condemn the woman who was caught in the act. He showed compassion. He stood on God's grace. Now please understand that, that this grace isn't just a free pass on sin. Remember, Jesus said in verse 11 to go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus stopped the judgment. Jesus stopped the execution. But Jesus also expected the woman to stop sinning. When Jesus shows God's mercy, he does it without compromising on sin by standing on God's righteousness. And he also does it with compassion by standing on God's grace. God's grace is an expression of both God's holiness and God's love. Because God is wholly perfect in all of his attributes and in everything he does, he commands the people that he created in his own image to be just like him, which is what Peter told the early church. Quoting from the Old Testament in 1 Peter 1 verses 15 and 16, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. But we know... Since we're all sinners, we can't be holy. So we have to depend on God to make us holy, to make us right with God, which is what Paul told the early church was by God's grace in Romans 3, verses 22 through 24. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, how did God make all of this possible? Paul goes on to explain in Romans 3, verses 25 and 26, that God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the good news that John wants us to know as he reveals these signs of new life in Jesus. That because of God's holiness and God's love, he sent Jesus to confront our sin with uncompromising compassion and mercy. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. While the religious leaders and the woman thought that this was a no-win situation, Jesus revealed another option, God's mercy. And by God's mercy, Jesus provides new life for everyone who believes in him. 
The question is, do you believe it? Do you trust that God's mercy is a sign of the new life that's found in Jesus? Now, if you've already put your faith in Jesus, you've experienced God's mercy. And so you can reveal that sign of life in you by showing God's mercy to others, by loving others, by forgiving others, by telling other people about the new life that you've received through your faith in Jesus. But if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, well, I encourage you to do that right away so that you can experience God's mercy and be forgiven of your sins and receive new life that begins in this life and continues into eternity with God when Jesus comes back to take us to heaven. You can receive God's mercy. You can receive that new life if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life. If you repent, turning away from your old sinful life and turning back to God for new life. And if you'll confess that Jesus is the Lord of this new life. And if you'll join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. When you put your faith in Jesus, God will forgive you and he'll come to live within you by his Holy Spirit and help you to live this new life, showing others the sign of his mercy in you so that they might believe in Jesus. Now, if you're ready to make that decision, uh, or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we might get together and work through all of that as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, we know that we're not perfect. We're sinners who need your mercy. I thank you that you've showed your compassion, your compassionate grace through Jesus, that you've made it possible for us to be forgiven so that we can have new life with you through faith in Jesus. Right now, I pray that you will show your mercy through your church to those people who still need to put their faith in Jesus. God, help us to share the good news of your love and your forgiveness and your mercy through Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen.